Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, Dave Albert. In this show, I talk about technology, building a company as a CTO and co-founder, and have guests to discuss their roles in technology and entrepreneurship. Today, I'm joined by Ed Burke, the CEO and sole founder of Rumigo. Hi, Ed. Thanks for joining me. I really appreciate it. It's great to be here. Thanks very much for yeah. um, having me. Great. Uh, to begin, how about you tell us a little bit about you and your background? Um, sure. So um, I'm an Irish tech entrepreneur. I did a business and law degree in UCD, uh, graduating uh, in 2007. And um, I was always very interested in entrepreneurship. Um, however, I decided to start my career um, in the law, um, partly because I thought law would be a good skill to have in a business world. And also it enabled me to travel internationally. So um, I got a job at a law firm in London. And while I was there, I was working in a, I worked in Moscow for some time as well. So um, I started off my career in, in London, as I was saying, um, pr- prior to the law job, I'd actually worked in Shanghai for a while. And Shanghai gave me a taste for, for Asia, Asia and Asian business. So in 2012, I decided I'd like to go back to Asia for a few years to get more experience working in the Asian markets because it's obviously the markets out there are huge um, and they're emerging. So I thought that's a good thing to do. So I spent a few years uh, living in Singapore. And while I was in Singapore, um, I was working full time, um, but I still had this entrepreneur uh, or this desire within me to be an entrepreneur. Sure, sure. So I was thinking about ideas and I never, I didn't have a solid idea, mm-hmm. but I knew that I liked property. I liked mm-hmm. the real estate space. Uh, my first job was actually with a real estate developer. Um, I really liked connecting people. And when everybody's got to live somewhere, <laughs> every, I, everybody has to live somewhere. Exactly. And um, as I'd lived in a number of different cities throughout Europe include, and, and Asia, including Dublin, I had always, I always needed somewhere to live, obviously. Mm-hmm. And it so happened that I was always living throughout my 20s in house share situations. Mm-hmm. So it was never just me and my own. And that is something that I think most people in their 20s do in virtually every city. You don't just live in your own, you live in shared accommodation. Yeah. So the question was always, when you move to a new place, you want to you want to live with good flatmates. Mm-hmm. You don't want to live with nightmare flatmates. Um, we've all had that situation and it just means you're going to have to go somewhere else or you're going to have to find somebody new. So the people with whom we live actually really kind of add to your life right. or to the enjoyment of your mm-hmm. life wh- wherever you move. And an interesting thing about living as an expat, particularly in a new city, and as the youth, the global youth workforce is more global, I'm sorry, more mobile than ever, yeah. there are more expats in different places than ever before companies do secondments, people move around. Right. So people actually use their living situation also as a means to uh, make friends. So you want your flatmates, a lot of people would want their flatmates to be more than just flatmates, to actually be friends. Mm. So my business is called Roomigo. And Roomigo is all about helping people find the right flatmates with whom to live. So not just any flatmate, to actually find a really good flatmate. And our tagline is actually live with friends. Nice. So it's the whole concept of bringing like-minded people together. Um, to live with compatible housemates. So how does it work is um, basically people create profiles on Romigo and those profiles, they have your photo, they have um, a bio, so some background information on you. And you also pick your most most important lifestyle choices and hobbies. Mm. So a lifestyle choice could be, you know, you're really quiet or you're outgoing or it could be that you like to... Um, you know, you're, you're a night owl, you know, and you, you stay up working really late and get up really late. So people have different lifestyle choices, hobbies and interests, uh, which are really important to people. Yeah. And 
what happens is we have these choices on on Remigo, and this means that we can provide incredibly rich matches. Um, so I don't, I, I, I can't think of any other platform in the world where you're moving to a new city and you're going to be in your 20s or maybe 30s. You, you're going to be living in shared accommodation. But if you're a really sporty person, you might want to, you might Sorry. spend your weekends, you know, playing sport and maybe watching, you know, football or rugby in the evening. So if you're a real sporty person, you might want to live with other sporty people. So on Remiga, we can actually provide these matches or whether you're into yoga or whether you're, um, you know, you're a party animal. Sometimes yeah. people in their <laughs> mid twenties, they love to go out and party, you know, uh, yeah. on seven nights a week. So you can find these people. Whereas when you're 35, maybe you don't want to, to do those Wednesday night parties anymore. <laughs> so, I can totally relate to that. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, so it's all about helping people find the right match for the stage of the of their lives that they oh, are at, okay. and just to help them have a better living situation. And then, of course, as I was saying, you go to a new city. Um, one problem people are facing in cities is people can be quite lonely in cities. Mm -hmm. They can be very lonely places, particularly if you're new to a city. And when I was growing up, I grew up in a town in Ireland and I knew all my neighbors. And yep. most people, when I was growing up, knew their neighbors. Yep. I was at a Young Innovators event in in uh, Shannon last week and it was for school kids from all over the country. And um, they had to present ideas which got put forward to a judging panel there was about a thousand kids at it they were split up into teams from each school and one of the teams that i was helping judge that came came in front of the panel i was on they had this idea about creating communities within cities but about connecting people which is very much what Remigo is about i found that very interesting because it was a bunch of school kids mm. that were explaining this so i said to to the guard who was presenting i said you know where did you come up with this idea and she said she she i think she had done an exchange in milan for a few months mm. and they were living in an apartment block but she said nobody knew their neighbors yeah. there and um this is a real issue for young people and even even old people so then i said to everybody else on our team and there was maybe i think there was eight or nine of them from that school i said to everybody else do you, where do you live? Do you live in a rural area or an urban area? They mostly, they, they mostly lived in an urban area. And I said, uh, do you know your neighbors? And I said, we don't know our neighbors. And that's actually a big problem in urban living because people don't know their neighbors anymore, which is another thing about Romigo. Because we know we will have, we have the housemates. We know all their interests. Um, not only can we help people find the right flatmates for a house, but we can also potentially help other people in the area connect because mm. we will know if in rat mines, for some reason, kind of 70% of the 25 year olds living there using Remigo like yoga and want to meet well, with people to do yoga, yeah. we can actually potentially connect those, those types of people as well. So mm. you have an incredible amount of data, which, uh, so the whole thing is about connecting people. So that's kind of an overview of what Romigo does and is. And uh, the idea effectively came from my experience yeah. living in house shares around the world. Yeah, no, I uh, I could definitely see the benefits of that beyond even your initial living situation. Um, even so as a tech person, a lot of us are introverts. Uh, so at even tech meetups where there are, dozens of other tech people most people don't strike up conversations <laughs> with others who explicitly have a similar interest so because there's too many people um so in these smaller segments i could i could see where that would you know continue to help people grow their network of people because once you're out of school it's not like you acquire new friends you you more acquire co-workers or colleagues or sure. professional acquaintances so that's that's really interesting so um it, you've you've got most of your users here in dublin is that correct yeah so um so wh what we decided to do was just to give you a little bit of background um on the road to kind of entrepreneurship and creating a business um 
it's very important to have a very focused idea yeah. and that there is a product market fit, that there's a need for your, for, for your business. So when I started off, I had more broad ideas initially. So I focused it more into this idea of helping people find the right housemates. So I needed to test whether there is a demand for this. Is mm -hmm. it just me or is there actually a genuine demand? So what I did was I started off by creating Facebook groups, mm -hmm. which is almost like a free way to test this concept. So within the Facebook groups, um, basically there are a bunch of people that are housemates. So they either have spare rooms or they're looking for rooms or they're looking for people to team up with because that's quite common as well. You move to a new city and you, you might see an, a two bed apartment, but you don't want to rent it on your own. So mm -hmm. you might want to find somebody else. Right. So within these Facebook groups, people find housemates. So I started off with one in Dublin and that was very successful. So then I, I built these Facebook groups in many other cities. So there are over 50,000 members within these Facebook groups that I manage. Um, Dublin being uh, kind of been the biggest groups. So I've got a very big group in Berlin as well. There are over 12,000 people in that group that's grown rapidly. And um, these Facebook groups enable me to learn about the market and get a feel for what the customer wants. Because every day I am seeing endless ads go up notices basically go up in the in, in the groups about what people want the type of housemates they're looking for what what are what is important to them so that's how i started off but the facebook group is actually very in, in inefficient mm. um in terms of filtering um the, it, it has very limited options it's you just have to keep scrolling down mm -hmm. um so it's very inefficient for finding that right person but it does prove the concept that people are much more interested in the people rather than just the property. So when I, having worked in these Facebook groups for some time, I then decided, right, I'm going to build a platform and the platform is going to connect people um, much more easily um, based on these shared interests and lifestyle choices that I was telling you about. So what I did was I got a platform built. So I'm a non-tech founder and for non-tech founders, it's actually a huge challenge to build good tech, to build the right tech. You've never done it before. So you, the first time you do it, you really don't know what you're doing. Yeah. So I started off by got, getting a very basic website built in Asia. I outsourced it to Asia, but this was kind of before I had the concept fully uh, thought out. So that just gave me a little bit of experience with, you know, building a product. But I, I quickly learned that you need to have a very focused product. And it's also very important to be very close to the team of people who are building your product. So if you're outsourcing a product to a foreign country, it's probably good to have uh, an in-house CTO or technical person that can manage that build carefully. Because when I was doing it, it was just me yeah. managing a team of people in Asia. And I kind of knew absolutely nothing about tech. So what I did then was I found a development company in Dublin that built our product, which the product that we built is very different to the initial uh, kind of prototype that we'd worked on. And we got that in Dublin. And what I then did was I found technical advisors mm. who could help with the kind of overseeing that process and because the team were, were based in Dublin, it was it was great because they were incredibly engaged in the project and they were very passionate about it as well. So, um, so you know, it worked out great. Where'd you find the technical advisors? Um, how do you find technical advisors? Um, well, where did you find yours? Well, how I found my technical advisors was through LinkedIn and, 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 and connections. Oh, okay. So okay. I think the way people find them is you just have to, you just have to network. You have to go yeah. to events, go to tech events, meet other founders that have done it before. Um, and you'll just get introductions and, and are also sometimes, I mean, just going on LinkedIn and reaching out to total randomers yeah. that, that seem like, uh, you know, they'd be good people to touch base with works as well. I mean, that has actually worked uh, uh, for me. Funnily enough, the developer that built our product, uh, 
He's he's um, a, 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 he's a great guy based in Dublin, a Chinese guy. I actually met him on a platform called Shaper, and kind of ironically, Shaper yeah. is about connecting professionals. Yeah, and, I've been on there before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and Ramiga is about connecting housemates. So there's a similar concept there. You're, that's you're how, a little far away from the mic. Sorry. sorry. There's a similar concept there. So that's how I met our, our, our developer via Shaper. And nice. our, our technical advisors was um, mainly via, via contacts that I made cool. throughout the process. So then just to get back to your original question, oh, yeah. we built the product <laughs> and we've launched the product in June in Dublin, which is the beta product. Um, it's going very well. We've, Excellent. We, so it's uh, we're really excited about that. We've got thousands of people on it now uh, connecting and uh, finding housemates, uh, even making new friends. So... Um, <clears throat> So, so that's where we are at the moment, and the plan is to expand outside of Ireland. So we want to go to Berlin next. Is it limited to just Dublin, or is it just not marketed outside of Dublin? At the moment, it's limited to Dublin. Okay. But the plan is very much to expand it outside yeah. of Ireland. I think it's very important to expand a business quickly and not yeah. just be in one market. Yeah. Having said that, like, you know, people often say, you know, test the product in your first mm-hmm. market, make your mistakes there, yes. you know, learn the, the, uh, kind of game plan for how you execute in this model. Right. And one thing about the type of product I have, there's no point in being the in, only user. Yeah. So like <laughs> I'm I could, connected with myself and yeah, nobody else. <laughs> exactly. So there's, there's no point in saying, Oh, we're going to have you in Dublin. We're going to be in San Francisco, New York, and 20 other cities because we could turn it on and it could be live there. Mm-hmm. But sure, if there's nobody, if there's only one person in each city, there's absolutely no point to it. So what we've been doing is we've just, we've, we've focused our, our early days and learning from the users in Dublin, um, finding out what's great about the product, what needs improvement, what needs to change and building up the user base here, which helps with the network connections. And then we've got a very solid core in Dublin. Cool. Very cool. Um, being a sole founder, what's that like? Um, being a sole founder, um, well, I guess it's hard to answer that question if you haven't done both. Exactly. (laughs) So it's kind of hard to answer that question, um, because I haven't done both, but it's very possible to do it being a sole founder. I, what's very important is, um, you, you want you want to have a, a team with a complementary skill set. Mm-hmm. So, a, for a tech company, it, it you know it would be great to have, uh, you know, uh, one founder and then maybe a CTO co-founder as well, mm-hmm. uh, at least. So, um, what we've done is we found um, we've got very good advisors, mm-hmm. and the idea is that uh, um, you know we'll bring. Um, we'll bring one of our advisors on board as this CTO when we've raised um, significant uh, significant money to hire them full-time and possibly sure. make them a CTO co-founder. So, um, but but yeah, I mean, it's tough, but the, the thing, the key thing is that you surround yourself with great te- great people and that you have the people in place then that you can hire full-time yeah. uh, when you have, um, when, when you, after you've raised uh, funding. Right. So what, what other than the Facebook groups, what's worked really well for you? Um, well, I think we also run events. Oh yeah, that's right. You do that. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? So yeah. So the, we, we, we run these community focused events for helping people find other housemates and make new friends. And, um, uh, the events, the events have worked very well for us. Um, they're very cheap to run. Mm-hmm. So what we do is we have meetups in a pub and we invite along people on our platform to it. It allows them to meet other people on the platform and it allows us to get feedback. So we've got, for in terms of building a community and building a relationship with our users, I think the events have been great. And they've also helped us from a marketing perspective as well because prior to having the platform, which we've only had since June, we didn't have a platform, so we needed to uh, to kind of do other things to help build our 
I suppose, our reputation and build up our community. So we started running these events even before the platform. And out of those events, we did get good contacts. So, for example, we helped the first co-living company launch in in, in Ireland. Uh, co-living companies are residential uh, apartment management companies, effectively, that um, rent out a bunch of apartments to like-minded professionals. So the whole idea of the co-living company is instead of just renting it out, renting out their apartments to anybody, they're actually trying to bring together like-minded people and they're trying to create this community uh, um, vibe. So the first co-living company that launched in Ireland last year actually approached us because they saw we were running these very much community-focused events um, so that led to a great relationship with them. And, um, you know, we got some good PR because of them as well, because of the, the events. Uh, Love and Dublin picked up in one of our events before we even had a platform. And, um, yeah, I just found them to be great for keeping, keeping close to our community. I think for, particularly for, for if you have a product which is a C to C product, as in consumer to consumer, like mm-hmm. Rumigo, it's very cl- important to keep engaged with the customer and show that you're, you know, you're serious about solving the problem and you're serious about listening to your customers, learning what their problems and needs are. Mm-hmm. And the events are a great way to do that. Plus, they're good crack and they're good fun as well. <laughs> you know, going out to the pub in Dublin for a few drinks, uh, um, it's always a bit of fun. Very nice. Very nice. So what didn't work out for you? What what sort of mistakes have you made that, um, that you could see not making if you were to try something like this? Yeah. I Well, I, I think like the first mistake I made was before I had a fully formulated um, idea, or I would say an idea that was sufficiently honed into a really strong compelling product, uh, I... I kind of had half an idea and I immediately rushed off yeah. and got this website built in Asia, yeah. which is basically, you know, we didn't use the web, the website. <laughs> it wasn't fit for purpose. It just didn't, uh, it just, I hadn't f- properly thought out the product. Mm-hmm. I hadn't properly thought out the idea. So I built something that, you know, probably wasn't needed or wanted. Uh, so that was a mistake. It didn't cost a huge amount of money, but it costs time, particularly it costs time and time is money. Time is very important in the startup world oh, yeah. because you want to be moving fast. So this certainly cost me a lot of time. Uh, so that was a mistake. However, having said that, I did learn a lot actually about how to build a product and you learn from your mistakes. And I realized, okay, I should have thought this out better in the beginning and I should have tested the concept more and I should have got to the core of what I'm really trying to do. And that's build, sorry, that is connect like-minded housemates. Whereas what I initially built was more akin to an old school property portal. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that was kind of one of the, the mistakes. I suppose, I mean, another one of the reasons I'm a, a sole founder is because I got the idea to set up a business when I was in Singapore. Mm -hmm. I was living and working full-time in Singapore. So when I came back to Ireland, um, I I decided, right, I'm going to run with this idea. And I started off by going to New Frontiers. And when I came back to Ireland, the funny thing is, when you've been kind of out of the country for the best part of 10 years, you don't really know that many people anymore. So... At that stage, like I didn't actually know that many people, so I was like, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to have to get to know people uh, all over again. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so that's kind of one of the reasons I was a sole founder. If I was to start it again, I'd probably, you know, you know, if it was see if I can start off with another co-founder or two from the beginning. Definitely, I would say a technical person. Uh, so that was uh, um, one of the reasons I started off as a sole founder, um, but. Then um, I thought a big challenge was finding technical people. And um, I guess I could have started looking for technical advisors Mm -hmm. a little earlier than I did. Um, I probably didn't quite appreciate the importance of having really good technical advisors behind you. Mm -hmm. So it took me a little bit longer before I actually started properly searching for technical advisors. 
And I think if I'd done that, when I immediately came back to Ireland, if I'd done that from the beginning and had better, you know, had uh, had technical advisors on board from, from day one, um, I think that would have made a difference because it would have saved me a lot of time and it would have just sped up the process in terms of finding a development team and so forth. Yeah, that, that's one of the things that we learned um, throughout the NDRC Accelerator program is that if we'd have made a few different decisions, things could have gone a lot faster. But how, how can you learn those things if you don't actually go through the process of learning them? But that's why we're here is to try to help those other people coming after us to uh, not make the same mistakes we made. It's kind of, yeah, yeah, it's funny you say that because the one thing I have noticed is founders tend to make the same mistakes over and over again. Oh, yeah. All the founders I speak to have, you know, they've made many of the same mistakes I've made. So you're trying to just learn from your mistakes and not make them again. Mm -hmm. And if you can help someone else not make the same mistakes, then that's incredible. Yeah. Well, it's a, uh, I can't remember the exact quote, but it goes something like wisdom is not repeating your own mistakes. Genius is not repeating other people's mistakes or uh, it goes something like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, after the last year, I'm no genius. <laughs> I've got some wisdom now. <laughs> not a lot. I still make some of the same mistakes, but not not the big ones. Not yeah. the big ones. Um, so if if you were to completely start over on something totally different, other than finding your technical founder, is there anything else that you might have done completely differently, or um, something that the you know your current experience would have led you to to make different decisions? Um. I think um, ooh, uh, there's a lot of stuff I would have done differently, which I think from the technical side I've described. Um, I think it's po it's certainly possible to build a very basic MVP without spending a lot of money just to test whether your concept works. So you don't you don't have to build the perfect website on day mm -hmm. one. That's what I, I initially thought. My, yeah. When I initially had this idea, I thought I'd build this brilliant website with all the bells and whistles of mm -hmm. a property portal. And that's not the way you're supposed to do it. Whatever the idea is, you just have to cut it back to what does it do at its absolute yeah. core and build that rather than trying to build something with all the features that you would ultimately like to have so you build something very basic um you can do that quite easily you could even use a wordpress website mm -hmm. and uh, see if you can get people to use your product or pay for something or mm -hmm. even if you don't have something to sell will they actually click on a button yeah. saying i will buy this yeah. so that you so there are there are ways to validate an idea much more easily than i would have initially thought uh, and, and quite quickly. So the whole thing about a startup is just you have to be very nimble, very flexible, and very open to uh, pivoting and, and changing if needs be. At the same time, you need stubbornness. Um, mm -hmm. So you don't just want to be kind of flip-flopping from yeah. one idea to the other. <laughs> it's very important to have a focus, but just to be able to, uh, it's, you know, to be able to, get to the core of your idea much more quickly and test that. Cool. So yeah, it's, I mean, it's your job in the very beginning is to validate your idea. Yeah. Not to, not necessarily to make sales of the final product. Yeah. If you can make sales in the beginning, that validates your idea. But you having people in those Facebook groups that were uh, engaged, that, absolutely validate your idea now it's just absolutely so it just it just kind of opened my eyes to how broken this industry is mm -hmm. so to think that there are literally tens of millions of people looking for housemates right now around the world and there's no one place that they can find those housemates there's they're on various property portals craigslist you know various facebook groups people are people are trying to find housemates everywhere but there's no one platform where people can go and say i'm going to find real people on this mm -hmm. that and i can match with like-minded people because another one of the problems that i quickly noticed was and i didn't realize this prior to starting was in this this is an industry where there are a lot of scammers oh. so a lot of fake 
accounts appear on social media and on property portals setting up fake ads so this has led to a massive breakdown of trust people moving to a new city um, they go onto a website looking for a room and they actually don't know whether it's a real room or not because there's so many fake rooms so um, so the Facebook groups are so kind of invaluable in that regard because the amount of I have to moderate the groups and I see the people joining the groups every day and the amount of fake accounts I see trying to join is just incredible. So I will, of course, block those. Um, but it really just opened my eyes to how big a problem, you know, not just finding the right housemates are, but just finding finding real people <laughs> that you can trust. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is, is there anything we haven't talked about that you think listeners should know? Um, or that you're well i think you were asking me about other stuff i would do and other advice yeah. i would give it's very important to be incredibly open-minded and uh to kind of be open to finding mentors mm -hmm. mentors are really important because mentors can give you guidance the best mentors are uh, entrepreneurs that have done it before yep. so there's other types of mentors like professional advisors and so forth but in the early days what you really need to do is you need to talk to entrepreneurs who have built businesses and who've created businesses and they can give you guidance because they've talked to hundreds of startups or thousands of startups mm. they've seen so many different ideas they've probably heard your idea before a hundred times mm -hmm. like so uh, uh, so they will Mentors are invaluable because they can guide you, they can help focus you, and um, I find them to be very helpful. I mean, there's so many great people in Dublin that are willing to help out new entrepreneurs and young entrepreneurs starting up. They understand how tough the journey is, and um, trying to find these people and surround yourself with, with these people is so, so important. And it's not that difficult to find them because there's lots of startup events on in Dublin that you can go to. There's networking events you can go to, meetup groups you can go to where you can meet people that could be potential mentors. So mentors in terms of people that have done it before, as in established entrepreneurs. And then also um, surrounding yourself with kind of a peer group of startup founders too who are at your stage or a little bit ahead of you because you're all going through the same process so um being surrounded with other young other startup entrepreneurs and uh having some mentors as well will make a huge difference because what you don't want to be doing is sitting at home in your bedroom working on an, on an idea mm -hmm. you know without having that support group around you, which ex ex exists and is very not difficult to get if you just go out and, you know, start meeting people. So that's, I think that's really important to get the mentors. It's, it's, that's pretty crucial. Yeah. And I, I'd say, um, you mentioned meetup groups and I was talking about how so many of the introverts find it hard to not always, but sometimes find it hard to create conversations with complete strangers it's a good idea to ask the organizers if maybe you could give just a lightning talk on what you're trying to do and what you're after. Uh, usually, I, I've never seen somebody ask to do that and them not get the opportunity. You know, just, I'm trying to create this product that solves this problem. Mm -hmm. I am looking for either technical advisors or possibly somebody to join me. Um, and almost every single start uh, meetup organizer is totally open to that. So that's I, a, a good yeah. way to, you know, start that instead of trying to go to every single person at a meetup. And I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's a, it's a, it's a great idea. Um, I mean, I find with a meetup just from a personal perspective, like I'm not trying to meet everybody at the meetup. Yep. If I can come out of the meetup with one new connection, whether it's somebody that's yeah. kind of at my level or even someone that's starting after me that I can give some advice to or, or whatever. If I can just meet mm -hmm. one kind of new connection that has a positive yeah. influence, that's, that's, that's great. Just trying to make meaningful connections. And then what you find as well is you find you start meeting the same people over again. Yeah. You know, yeah. I met somebody, I was at an event last night for the Founders Institute. The Founders Institute is an idea stage incubator, which is something definitely worthwhile checking out because you don't need to, you can work in your job and the Founders Institute is on in the evenings mm. and it, it helps you develop ideas. So I was at just one of their events last night and uh, I met a young entrepreneur there 
Uh, he's fresh out of college. And the last time I met him actually was an, at, at an event in Trinity about a year ago. <laughs> and it was kind of, it was exciting to see because I remember he him telling me about his idea a year ago. Yeah. And now he's kind of brought his idea forward um, and he's, you know, looking to work in it full time. So, uh, so that was really interesting for me, actually. Just, I'm, I don't think I gave him any, any useful advice, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> it's, it's fun for me to see, uh, to see, to see, uh, to see someone again a year later that they that they had this, this kind of spark of an idea and, you know, and it's, it's just fun to see them taking it yeah. forward. And, uh, actually, uh, he was a great guy to meet because, um, you know, he knows he knows all the uh, technical students yeah, coming yeah, out of Trinity. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I was like, "This is great." Right? Yeah. <laughs> you may say you didn't help him, but sometimes just a smiling face that has validated that yeah. that they believe in your idea is something to keep you going. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. that's so true as well. Yeah, um, yeah uh, absolutely. You can kind of feed off it, you know, positivity and people that are just you know, kind of support your idea and like your product it's it's great to meet people like that as well yeah yeah uh anything else that you want to bring up um but it kind of that's i don't think i have much more uh advice to add but what about yourself you've got an incredible background and you're you're um a technical guy so uh what advice would, would you have uh for yeah, people uh definitely i mean like you said that I've seen people make the mistake of building. See, that's funny. I, I say don't build things yet, okay. cause I've made that mistake so many times. I, my job is to solve problems. So I hear a problem. My brain starts trying to solve the problem immediately. So it's taken me a long time to get to the phase where it's like, is this a problem worth solving? Do we know people want it solved? And it's not just something that sounds cool to work on. Uh, but then so many people who don't have technical founders, co-founders, come to me asking, how should we do this? How can we outsource this? And it's really hard to do. Like, uh, we've got some remote workers, but I'm here. So I can consistently, you know, review, not just review their code, but review the direction. And, you know, it's a constant iterative feedback loop as opposed to someone like yourself, who's a business founder who doesn't necessarily know the full process. And so, the technical people go off and then they come back weeks, months later, and it may or may not be exactly what you were looking for. Um, so it's find a technical advisor, uh, even if it's just a couple of hours a month or anything that is better than trying to just deal with an agency to build something for you without you being directly involved. But if, if your core product is software, it's really hard to do something in that space without somebody who understands software. So true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I understand the reasoning thinking that you could do without it, but I, it's, it's really not possible. And the same with if you're a hundred percent technical and you don't think you can ever sell, then you need to find a co-founder. You can't just make something great and hope people come find it. That doesn't work. You have to sell it, Whether that's to sell it to the users, sell it to investors, sell it to communities. It doesn't matter. You have to learn to sell or find somebody who can do that better mm. than you can. Mm. Totally. I suppose uh, just to add, I mean, um, in terms of supports for startups, there are quite a lot in Ireland. There's, um, uh, um, if people are unaware um, and sometimes people that are new to the game are actually very unaware of the various supports that um, that exist so uh, the local enterprise offices are really good mm. they're very supportive of startups they have grants that are, can help you build that first product um, there is also um, Enterprise Ireland they run New Frontiers New Frontiers um, it's a program for you know it's uh, p people with ideas and um, then, of course, there are accelerators such as the NDRC, um, and the NDRC gives you investment to help you take your your uh, idea to the next stage. So there are lots of supports there for you. Um, so you just have to uh, to kind of start engaging with people, getting out there, meeting people, 
And uh, once you have that idea and you want to build it, um, it's very possible to get it built. You don't need a hundred grand sitting in your bank account yeah. or you don't need investors at that stage. You can get stuff built and um, you can get simple stuff built and you and there are plenty of supports there to help you financially build that stuff as well. Cool. Yeah, definitely. All right. How can people contact you? Um, people can contact me at Rumigo. So my email is ed at Rumigo.io. So that's R O O M I G O dot I O. Cool. I'll uh, post that and anything else you want in the show notes. So. Thank, thanks a million. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you for listening. Until next time, remember any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic.